What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Today I'm proud to bring you the 100th Skyrim build video in our Skyrim Special Edition Builds playlist. And while it is most certainly a modded build, it can easily be played vanilla as well. We've put a perk link in the description for vanilla players, but for those with mods we're using Ordinator. This character is named Elaine, and he has had one hell of a life journey as you'll hear all about in the backstory. It's a rags to riches tale, and this build, while called the king won't actually be one while you're playing him. He is a fallen king, seething with an urge to conquer, control, and manipulate his way to success. This character gives off a real noble rogue vibe aesthetically, but he definitely plays dirty and will do whatever it takes to succeed. As far as the playstyle goes, he is very versatile, always doing what he can to gain an unfair advantage, but oftentimes making fights appear fair when they are not. He is obsessed with his image, he is two-faced, and he only looks out for himself. At one second, he's promising someone the world if they stand by his side, and the next, he is casting them aside or having them assassinated when they are no longer of use for his plans. This is one of the most brutally selfish characters we've ever created, and being the 100th build in the Skyrim Special Edition playlist, we definitely wanted to make it a good one. He can assassinate well, he can fight well on his feet, and he moves fast too. He can steal, lockpick, and use his speech to persuade and intimidate people in his favor. As always, timestamps are in the description for you to navigate your way around the sections of this build because it is a big one if you desire. But let us hold off no longer for there is so much to say about this sensational character. This is the king. Now when it comes to the mods we're using, we're not actually going to be using the alternate start mod like we usually do. Instead, we found the standard entry into Skyrim works quite well with the backstory. You'll hear all about this backstory soon enough, but for now, just know you won't need that mod. I mean, you could just change the very end of the backstory if you wanted to and use the alternate start mod, but you really don't have to. And this is another reason why this build really is playable for vanilla players, as well as people who want to utilize the foundational build improving mods we like to add to our characters. Another thing relating to this is the immersive armors mod. So we're using this for the awesome chest piece you see in the video, but the rest of the armor can be found in the base game. Like we usually do, we're going to be using the Imperious Races of Skyrim mod and the Andromeda Standing Stones of Skyrim mod. If you've listened to us talk about what we desire in Elder Scrolls 6, you'll know that more diversity when it comes to racial passives, powers, abilities, and all of that stuff is high up on our list. This is exactly what the Imperious Races of Skyrim mod helps with, although in Elder Scrolls 6, I'd love for the races to have some weaknesses as well as the cool benefits. So if you haven't figured it out already, we're playing a Breton. The Andromeda Unique Standing Stones of Skyrim mod gives us all new effects for the 13 stones, two of which this build can use. As for the weapon, the saber we're using is from the Oblivion Artifact Pack SE mod and it does a few things, but notably it slows down your opponent. Finally, we've got the Ordinator Perks of Skyrim mod. Now to help include the vanilla players, remember we've actually got a vanilla perk set which can be found linked in the description below. However, for everyone using mods, which is primarily how this build is best suited, you'll be implementing the Ordinator Overhaul. This mod makes the statistical side of the build more complex and allows us to gain a few cool powers and effects which play into the combat and stealth hybrid playstyle. As mentioned, this build is a Breton, and he was born in the High Rock Kingdom of North Point. With the Imperious Races of Skyrim mod, this means you will escape the chopping block with 95 health, 105 magicka, and 100 stamina. You'll have 0.75% health regeneration per second, 3.125% when it comes to magicka, 4.75% when it comes to stamina, and your carry weight will begin at 300. This build doesn't actually use use Magicka, but there's a lot more to a build's race than the base stats and how fast they regen. For example, you have an unlockable power called Shared Ancestry. Once a day, you can temporarily gain the racial power of a target man or mer. So if you're ever feeling a bit jealous that your Breton can't use an Orc's Berserk power, fear not, because we're going to steal it. Just by chance, this really fits into the backstory of this build and who the character is, because it involves him stealing power from others. We then get three passive abilities called Grail of Betany, Spell Mantle, and Stones of Galen. With Grail of Betany, you may find a Grail in Skyrim that allows you to regen Magicka and Stamina 50% faster. With Spell Mantle, you'll get a 15% resistance to Magic, which is awesome for any build, but then you'll also get 25% Spell Absorption when Magicka is 25% or less. Because we don't use Magicka, you probably won't end up with 25% or less, but if you wanted to, in theory, you could just equip a basic spell like Flames in both hands and 
and drain it all before battling a magic using character. As for Stones of Galen, each Standing Stone grants its own bonus effect, so let's just jump straight into talking about Standing Stones for this build right now. For the Standing Stones we're actually using, you can pick between the Shadow Stone or the Lord Stone, depending on how you find yourself playing with this character. While playing the King, if you find that you're definitely using stealth all the time, and you want a Zipia speed-oriented Noble Rogue, then go with the Shadow Stone. This gives you a few abilities. There's Blur, which simply increases your movement speed by 20% in combat, which I personally think can suit this build very well, as it gives him a nimbler duelist vibe, and it's very useful in combination with a sword enchanted to slow enemies down. The Shadow Stone also gives you Hide in Shadows, and this means that as you're sneaking around a wall or obstacle, your sneaking is 20% more effective, and your sneak attacks are as well. Finally, there's an unlockable ability called Shadow Step. At will, this allows you to expend 50 points of stamina to dash to a nearby target within 75 feet. Luckily, as you'll find out, the king will have plenty of stamina to use for this ability if you choose to go with this stone. Now, if you're playing less stealthy and more combat oriented, you can still go with the shadow stone just for the increased movement speed, but you might prefer the lord stone. This goes with the whole kneel before the king vibe, and it makes this build more dangerous in the form of ruthless power attacks. So with the Andromeda mod, you'll get the crown of autumn effect. What this does is make stamina not regenerate while you're in combat, and as a positive result, it makes your power attacks deal 20% more damage and stagger. This helps the build to feel like more of an unshakable force to be reckoned with, and because we have so much stamina, you won't be running out too often. However, if you do run out, the Lord Stone will then give you the Old Stone ability. What this does is allow you to keep power attacking even when you don't have stamina, but these attacks will deal 30% less damage and stagger. Finally, the Lord Stone grants the King an unlockable ability named Kneel or Be Knelt. Once a day, you can throw a target to the ground, dealing 15 magic damage and absorbing that much stamina for 10 seconds. This is useful for getting any power attack potential back in the form of absorbed stamina. You're a figure of raw power, and you'll be able to demonstrate this physically once per day if you feel so inclined. Now, all of that said, remember as a Breton, we're going to have the Stones of Galen effect, which adds an additional effect to your standing stone choice. For the Lord Stone, the Stones of Galen effect means it also makes weapon enchantments 15% more effective on striking. Because we're using an enchanted blade as our only damage dealer, this is a really nice bonus. As for the Shadow Stone with Stones of Galen, you get a 20% chance for your sneak attacks to do double damage. On average, just treat it as if one of every five of your sneak attacks will deal double damage, and you can have a think about how useful that is for you. At the end of the day, this build will be played as a stealth combat hybrid, regardless of whether you choose the Lord or the Shadow Stone, but that's the rationale behind your options. As for a stat spread, the King will be using 50% health and 50% stamina. Magicka is not needed at all, and many magic-fearing citizens of Skyrim would actually respect him achieving power without the use of the arcane arts. That said, he will of course still use shouts, which are still an otherworldly power, but they are respected by the people of Skyrim, and with the ability handed to him on a platter, he's not going to decline it. A 50% stat investment is more than enough to keep this character alive when it comes to health. His armor is not the sturdiest, but remember, stealth is roughly half the focus of this build's approach, depending on the scenario and also how you want to play. Now, 50% stamina is very useful for this build. It will allow him to sprint a lot, which we have perks to give us benefit from, and it will also allow the king to actually deal more power attack damage due to the furious strength perk. Furthermore, we have a perk called Fight or Flight, which involves regenerating stamina, and the amount used is based on your max stamina pool. The king will also perform sneak rolls, and this actually opens a window to deal more stealth damage afterwards via the dynamic entry perk. So that's why we've chosen the stat allocation we have. Now for the backstory, role playing, and faction choices. The king's origins are not what you'd expect. No lavish living conditions, no servants waiting on every desire of a young prince. In fact, he was never a prince at all. This climb to kinghood was done on stairs of deception, treachery, and manipulation. He was a low-class Breton, born in High Rock, the 172nd year of the Fourth Era in the Kingdom of North Point. His father was an Imperial captain and had been stationed at the Great Port City for a period of time during the Great War with the Aldmeri Dominion. Here, his father would become enamored with a tavern wench. After many evenings in his quarters, this lady would eventually become pregnant, and upon approaching the captain with the news, he dismissed it immediately, claiming her to be a liar. Weeks later, he was reassigned to a new post, somewhere else 
house in Tamriel, a somewhere he wouldn't be telling the tavern wench. This woman would become the mother to our character, the king. However, he was not a king yet, but a lowly street urchin. His name was Elaine, and as soon as he was old enough to hold a broom, the kid was sent to work, sweeping the tavern, sweeping the streets, sweeping anything and everything that he could be paid a septum for. By the young age of eight, an opportunity had come his way. His mother had been fraternizing with one of the castle guards, and this guard had the brilliant idea of getting the kid to sweep the castle courtyard, a guaranteed and continued job every day of the week. He would no longer have to knock on doors offering services for the chance someone would pay him to sweep something, so the young child took it, or more like his mother told him to, but he didn't mind. The castle made for better scenery than the filthy gutters of Lower North Point. The child worked here for years, working day in and day out, all the while watching every member of high society that came and left the castle. He would be able to memorize names and sigils of kings, nobles, diplomats, and even some rich merchants significant enough to have an audience. It was beautifully fascinating to him. He listened carefully to the way they spoke. He observed their walk and posture, even how they would dismount their horse. He began to incorporate their movements, their etiquette, taking on the characteristics of the elite. He envied them, had a desire to be them. After a few years, the young boy would move his way up in the world, all the way from courtyard sweeper to prestigious servant. His diligence was spotted by the serving staff and he was given the duty of carrying drinks and food to the audience of nobles inside the castle. His work ethic was unmatched, and while he wasn't paid much at all, it was still more than he'd ever been given. Soon the castle became his second home, and his fascination with nobility continued to grow. He would stand nervously, trying not to draw attention during the fieriest of debates, and he would be bringing food and water to the tables in the midst of important trade deals, even philosophical arguments. Elaine had such an influx of information to try and wrap his head around that he actually began to keep a diary in secret. It was kept at home, however, and he would have to remember what happened each day in his head and then write it all down before he slept. He would be privy to a range of overheard topics ranging from war to love to power and influence to respect, loyalty, and deception. It seemed that the most successful nobles were not only honorable and confident, but they were also highly intelligent, always looking to develop their mindset to improve their circumstances. This is what he admired most about them, but he also noticed their tendency to play dirty when need be for the greater good of the kingdom. These nobles were often too careless around those they did not perceive as threats, such as Elaine, and would often say things that should probably have been uttered in a hushed tone. As the years went by, Elaine developed his mind greatly, and part of his talent was hiding it the entire time. He had a firm grasp on power dynamics, and he knew to never outshine the master. He also knew the power of spectacle. Elaine could tell the king maintained an untouchable aura by putting on a show. He would throw festivals in his honor and would give generously in the eyes of as many witnesses as possible. He would say one thing to a traveling diplomat with the most sincere of language, only to say the opposite to his trusted nobles once the traveler had departed. He was strategic to the core, and Elaine saw all these techniques as the stepping stones to power. Sadly for him, however, it was very hard to just become a noble if you weren't born into the right bloodline. The unfortunate fact was that Elaine would soon find himself in hot water and not the kind he'd carry for the steward's tea. No, while Elaine had his eyes above him on the regal folk, he'd made the fatal mistake of not watching his back. Elaine had been paid a little more than the other servants due to him being entrusted with helping to clean the king's room. The king of North Point trusted Elaine would never steal, and as a result, he was one of the only servants allowed in that room to clean, and sometimes even to deliver wine and other treats during after hours. Anyways, there was another servant who was doing it quite tough, and he longed for the extra pay Elaine received. This fellow serving boy decided to frame Elaine for stealing from the king's room in a way that was so convincing that Elaine was certain he had to have possessed some kind of magic, sneaking a bunch of silverware out of the kitchen and planting it on him without him knowing. It was here when Elaine learned an important lesson. In the pursuit of acquiring the power of those above you, never forget that there are those below you who are trying to take what you have as well. Upon discovering this thievery, Elaine was embarrassed in front of a large crowd, and the king, wanting to present himself as too benevolent to harm a servant and too rich to care about some silverware, simply had the guards throw Elaine out onto the street. Obviously, he had some bruises, but it was not like he was executed. The worst thing was that Elaine had lost his job and the study grounds for his favorite interest, 
power. On the streets, Elaine was treated incredibly poorly and even his mother was ashamed of him. He was the only one that trusted himself, the only one who truly knew he didn't steal. In fact, if it wasn't for his own intuition, he wouldn't have even known it was a fellow servant who framed him. He knew the servant boy didn't like him and he made some very egotistical and sarcastic remarks to Elaine as he left, trying to conceal a very guilty stare. Elaine had learnt to read people. He couldn't prove the other boy had framed him, but he just knew it in his gut. Now, life on the streets was not easy and bitter from his situation, Elaine decided to pursue a different life. After all, he still needed to get by. Elaine made a decision to leave his life behind, to take a risk. He was going to leave North Point, travel around to other towns and kingdoms nearby, and take whatever he could get away with, growing his influence if at all possible. Elaine was almost 16 years old when he made this decision, and as time went by, it was clear he wouldn't be able to gain influence. He simply wasn't born noble, and so he ended up as a thief. He would go around stealing everything he could and and then disappear into the night. If things got too hot, he simply moved to the next city before he was discovered, or in the most unfortunate cases, until his face was forgotten. At the age of 18, his strategies evolved, and Elaine became more of a shyster, a traveling con man, if you will. He was now old enough to pretend to be a young noble, and he would use mannerisms he learnt from royalty to impersonate people. He would steal fancy clothes and take advantage of unsuspecting citizens, demanding tax money or gaining access to a shop storeroom only to disappear with loot or coin after people trusted he was truly an official. He would constantly practice stealth, learning to steal as effectively as possible, and always needing to nab new outfits. He would drift from city to city, sometimes pretending to be an enchanter, falsely blessing someone's amulet with such confidence they took his word for it. It was just raw confidence in every ounce of his frame which allowed him to pull it off. If the castle was his learning grounds, being on the street and then traveling around to various cities as a con man, that was his training grounds. Now eventually as a young adult, aged 19, Elaine was traveling the roads of High Rock when he stumbled across a group of dead guards and a slain noble. There were claw wounds all over the corpses and the blood was so thick beneath them that in some areas you couldn't even see the top of the soil where the grass emerged. Curious, merely from a financial point of view, Elaine began to sift through the bodies, taking their coin and looking for any treasured valuables. What he found, however, was some something far more useful than expected. Letters from the King of Shornhelm were on the body of the dead noble, welcoming the deceased adult to join his court as a permanent advisor. The letters also included condolences from the King of Shornhelm regarding the noble's father's death and how he would like to meet his father's son, who was apparently known for his intellect. The son was, of course, the dead noble who'd been killed by bears on his way to the kingdom. Elaine studied the dead man's face. Coincidentally, it looked an awful lot like himself, and from here, he hatched a plan. Elaine decided to become an imposter. He would blend his talents of being a con man with his knowledge of regal conduct to impersonate the son in attempt to fool the king and join his advisory board. Elaine took his clothing and his paperwork. He looked the part and knew he could act it. The only trouble would come if he was questioned on his father, but he would cross that bridge when he got to it. He had a knack for improvisation and at times of pressure, he could say that he prefers not to speak of his father for the death still saddens him. And so Elaine took on a new identity, and of course a different name, but for the sake of story clarity I shall still refer to this character build as Elaine throughout the story. And off he went, taking a huge risk, for if he was discovered for pretending to be this noble, he would surely face the chopping block. Arriving at Shornhelm, Elaine had already assumed the persona of a noble, looking incredibly self-important, and even casting snobby glances towards the lower class citizens he was once one of back in North Point, and so he headed to the castle with a stomach full of nerves and a heart full of courage. From an onlooker's perspective, his gaze was as solid as steel, and he walked like a divine god. Approaching the guards at the castle door, he presented his letters and explained that his guards had been attacked by bears. They died defending him, and he barely got out alive, hence the tattered clothing. Immediately, he was taken to the king. Elaine, acting as the deceased noble, was welcomed by the king and the court. His years of studying nobles had paid off, and he seamlessly blended into this new high society living. Without suspect of question, he fulfilled the role of advisor in the royal court, a servant to the king of Shornhelm. It was the perfect con. Elaine was living a lie, but for months on end, he would feel that he really was this noble.
Noble, almost believing his own lies. That is, until loose ends would start appearing. Few fellow nobles in the royal court would suspect Elaine as an imposter, finding small inconsistencies or gaps of logic in his stories. These particular nobles would disappear or be disgraced in the following months for various reasons, all of Elaine's orchestration. Over many years, Elaine would become very well respected among the nobles, and he became very close with the king. But to maintain this position, to maintain this lie, Elaine had to engage in some activities some would consider immoral. Whether by his own hand or hired assassins, anyone who came close to discovering his truth was killed. Sometimes assassination was not necessary, but some planted evidence and a few paid off witnesses could disgrace or discredit others, preventing them from furthering their investigations or convincing others of their theories. Elaine had been changed. Living a lie is never healthy, but he was about to take his ambitions to new heights. He had become the most trusted advisor of the king and personal confidant. Usually their private conversations were inconsequential talk of philosophy, personal troubles, or just some classic court gossip. However, it was this day where the king would talk of matters most sensitive, matters of a treasonous nature. The king was conspiring to have another noble in the court killed. The noble in question was loved by many, including the king, but he would not cease his talks of new laws that would empower nobles to remove the king from power if he were to be voted incompetent by the court. Of course, this was proposed for the betterment of the kingdom. None had quarrel with the king of Shornhelm. He was a great ruler, but his son was considered weak and impotent, a poor successor. The king knew this, but regardless loved his son and would not have his future compromised. Elaine could understand this decision and admitted to himself that he would do the same. However, his ambition out paced his hypocrisy. Elaine took this information and conspired with the noble in question to displace the king. Two months later, after a failed assassination attempt on this man, thanks to Elaine, the king was executed in his throne, stabbed to death by his nobles for treason. The king's son and family fled Shornhelm. A vote would then be held amongst the nobles, deciding who should be the new king, all part of Elaine's plan perfectly calculated. He had carried favor with almost all the nobles, and particularly the most honorable among them, by exposing the king. Elaine, impersonating a noble, was voted in by 65% of the vote. At 28 years old now, from street sweeper to con man to noble to king. Elaine's is a true story of rags to riches, however disingenuous the means of ascendancy. Elaine ruled as king brilliantly. It was as if he was born for the job. He won the love of the people, his allies valued him, and his enemies feared him. He was on his way to great things, until one variable, one unlikely person would arrive in Shornhelm, a year into his rule. The cousin of the man Elaine had been impersonating for nearly 10 years returned from his travels of Tamriel. An explorer and sailor longed to see his cousin and all that had changed for him. He heard he was king now. Surprise was an understatement when Elaine and this man met. Elaine was exposed. Nobles were in uproar. They wanted Elaine's head. Some nobles and closest allies of Elaine helped him out of the city. They loved him as the good king he was, disregarding his origins. Elaine had tasted greatness. His dreams had become reality. Years of work and perfection, only to be torn down in an instant. He escaped Shornhelm and kept away from the roads, traveling in disguise through the mountains over many months, far into the Jarrah Mountains at the border order of Skyrim, far from his troubles. But trouble still awaits for the king. Elaine is caught and carted to Helgen amongst an imperial stormcloak conflict destined for execution. Perhaps this was his fate, or perhaps the gods have other grander plans for the king. After escaping Helgen, the king begins to see potential in the war-torn lands of Skyrim to start anew. His face is far too well known in Hyrock. It was far too dangerous to return. He may never return to power in Hyrock, but no one in Skyrim has a clue who he is. From here, he will start again, working from the shadows, building his way from the bottom and gaining true influence. His plans will be based on all of his success and mistakes throughout his life, and he will be sure to never make the same mistake twice. He will aim to acquire as much power as possible, doing whatever it takes while making sure nobody knows of any shady business he controls, or at least those who do know would never be able to expose him without dying a quickly arranged death. Using his skill set, the king will end up joining the Thieves Guild and rising through their ranks, becoming a Nightingale and Thieves Guild master. He will expand the Thieves Guild as much as he can, using their influence to bribe guards all around Skyrim, becoming above the law and very importantly, becoming very, very 
rich. He will also do the Dark Brotherhood, killing for money, acquiring more influence in the form of not just increased wealth, but also the best assassins at his disposal. Through a combination of leading and manipulating both the Thieves Guild and the Dark Brotherhood, the King will have no trouble stealing important items, framing rivals for doing things, having people killed and having the law in his pocket. Having these guilds under his control gives him a very powerful network, but it is still not enough. While rising to the throne in each of these guilds, the King will also be doing good deeds for the people of Skyrim, acting like a very charitable and benevolent person. He will do this to create a very good image of himself in the eyes of the people, and ultimately this will help him in gaining favour with the various Jarls around the land, and he eventually becomes Thane of every hold possible. That said, he will actually help the Stormcloaks to take over Skyrim, siding with Ulfric and becoming his right-hand man. A divide and conquer tactic. It is in his best interest to destabilise the Empire and remove their control of Skyrim, if he is to ever successfully seize power for himself. He's gifted in stealth and sabotage, he knows how to hide in the shadows, but also knows how to hide his true self when out in the light. He will use his Dragonborn status to create an air of spectacle and wonder around himself, and the people of Skyrim will greatly admire this. He will have a noble rogue vibe, always wanting the upper hand, and only fighting when the odds are in his favour. Nothing is left to chance, and everything is calculated, even though it may not seem that way to others. Any quests you want to do involving power are great, such as Daedric Prince quests. Just make sure people aren't aware of your dealings with evil Daedra. You'll also be looting and selling, and just generally taking advantage of your silver tongue wherever you can. So he's definitely not the stereotypical noble king. He's been thrown to the wolves, and his plan is to come back leading the pack. Now for the statistical side of things, let's start with skills, and then we'll talk about shouts, perks, and the playstyle. So the skills for this build are one-handed sneak speech, lockpicking, pickpocket, and light armor. While six may sound like a lot of skills to use with a mod that makes perks and skill trees dive a lot deeper, aka the ordinator perk overhaul, the mod also simplifies the base effectiveness of skills into less perks. For this reason, we were able to be quite good at lockpicking and pickpocket without having to allocate huge amounts of perk points into them. More about skills in the perks section. As for spells, this build doesn't use any, but that's not to say that he won't be using some seriously special powers. By this, of course, I mean the power of dragon shouts. The king would be a fool not to use such a divine gift to his advantage wherever possible, and unlike magical spell casting, which he has no skill in, the people of Skyrim revere the dragonborn and would respect his use of the thumb. So when it comes to shouts, you don't need me to tell you what you can and cannot use. However, what I do recommend are using shouts that go well with the getting the upper hand theme of this build. Some cool options are disarm, bend will, and marked for death. As the name suggests, the disarm shout allows you to actually shout an enemy's weapon from out of their grips, leaving them helpless to your onslaughts with no immediate way to defend themselves or properly fight back. Bend will is really cool for the king build. The king is an expert at emotional manipulation through his silver tongue and inspiring presence, but also through other tactics such as blackmail, intimidation, and trickery. That said, there are some mortals who are simply not malleable. This is where the bend will shout comes into play, allowing you to force enemies to fight for your cause. The bend will shout also allows you to ride dragons, which is pretty cool for role-playing as the king is well aware of the power of spectacle. Riding on a dragon is mesmerizing to those who witness him, and it adds greatly to his presence and sense of divinity. It also strikes fear in the hearts of those who oppose him on the battlefield. Finally, Marked for Death is another great shout. This fits well with the character because it simply weakens the enemy, giving the king a kind of unfair advantage. His opponents are worn down, their health drains along with their armor, making them more susceptible to his damage, and overall the fight becomes easier for him to win. Now let's talk about perks. The building blocks within each of the mentioned skills that help make the king a truly unique and formidable force. Also, as mentioned earlier, we have created a set of vanilla perks for those without mods. Link is in the description. The king may be a master at deceiving others, of being tactical to win by any means necessary, but do not let that detract from his very real ability to hold his own in a fight. The king becomes an absolute savage with a blade in his grasp, and this is represented by the one-handed skill tree. Yes, he likes to sabotage his foes with an enchanted blade. Yes, he will sneak to avoid detection and use his voice to intimidate and persuade, even to drag and shout others into dust. However, if you take all of this away from him, there's still a very good chance he'd out duel you fair and square. From the one-handed skill tree, we're going to be getting one-handed mastery, two out of two, furious strength, overrun, disciplined fighter, rogues parry, clash of champions, three out of three, crosscut, two out of two, falling sword, win 
wind swept into the dust judgment and wandering warrior. Let's talk about some perks of note. Two ranks of one-headed mastery gives you 50% more damage and you'll get 2% more critical damage with it per level of one-handed. So when you have 100 in the one-handed skill, that's going to be 200% more crit damage. This goes nicely with the rogue's parry perk, which allows you to deal 40% more damage and a critical strike if you attack an opponent while they're winding up their attack or drawing a bow when of course you have a sword in one hand and nothing in the other. Another neat perk involving critical damage on top of this is Overrun. This allows you to perform a one-handed sprinting power attack that deals up to 50% more damage and critical damage to an enemy above half health. The higher their health, the more normal damage and crit damage you do. But wait, there's more. With the Falling Sword perk, forwards power attacks with our sword will make foes bleed for 20 seconds. Now the thing is, when a bleeding target's health bar drops below 25%, an attack you do to them will count as a critical strike that deals 10 times critical damage. Pretty crazy stuff. Now, power attacks are bolstered by the Furious Strength perk. The king is able to turn his stamina into rage, with his one-handed power attacks dealing 15% more damage and then 0.1% more on top of this per point of stamina you've got. This perk also unlocks decapitations. With three ranks of the Clash of Champions perk, attacks with the king's sword will reduce his target's attack damage by 20% for three seconds. This fits in perfectly with his theme of making his opponents less effective in order to dispose of them, and alongside a sword which is enchanted to slow enemies down and steal their energy, it's a deadly combination. This is enhanced by the Judgment perk, which restores 100 points of stamina when you slay an enemy under the effect of Clash of Champions. We then have both ranks of Crosscut, which allows your power attacks to be 50% stronger on a specific target for 4 seconds after you land an unblocked regular attack on said target. This incentivizes you to not actually just spam power attacks. You may enter battle with a sprinting power attack, getting the full advantage of the overrun perk, then let off a normal attack while your opponent is winding up an attack, taking advantage of rogue's parry, and then follow the regular attack up with a power attack, unleashing the force of the crosscut perk. Next up, we have the sneak skill tree. The king may be able to hold his own in combat, but he prefers to stick to the shadows when he can, allowing himself to target the enemy where they are most vulnerable at the time they are most vulnerable. With stealth, he is able to strike the enemy where it hurts the most, before they even have a chance to respond. Of course, the king will rely on informants and networks within his guild, such as the Thieves' Guild, but there are also situations where heading into the shadows by himself is the best option, whether it be to assassinate a rival, or to steal important documents from a locked safe, or pickpocket an enemy to take a special item, or even to put something in their pocket to frame them for a crime. The king can pull it all off himself if need be. From the sneak skill tree, take sneak mastery to out of two, silent roll, dynamic entry, Fog of War, Right Behind You, Infiltrator, Behind Enemy Lines, Shadow Warrior, Clean Escape, Sneak Attack, and Problem Solver. The King can also utilize Sneak Rolls, enabled while sprinting during Sneak Mode, thanks to the Silent Roll perk. What's cool, however, is that he then has the Dynamic Entry perk. Here, he uses the momentum of his roll to increase the power of his stealthy attack. So when you perform a Silent Roll, his sword's damage will be increased by 40% for 3 seconds. With the Infiltrator perk, the King will make 75% less noise when sneaking in the form of quieter footsteps and armor. Then we have the right behind you perk, which actually makes stealth feel more realistic. When you're hiding in your target's blind spot, sneaking is 15% more effective within 30 feet and 30% more effective within 15 feet. We also chose problem solver, which makes the king's sneak attacks do 10% more damage for each 200 points of health the target has, up to 50% more damage. It goes without saying that most targets you sneak attack will be at full health anyway, so this is very useful to just get a high damage first strike on your foes, and hopefully it's the only strike you need. Our next skill to explore is speech. Without a doubt, the king knows the power of his tongue. He has always believed that one must be excellent with their word in order to truly obtain power, and especially to maintain it. Not only is the king a wordsmith, he also has an adept ability to scan people and read their emotions. He can quickly figure out someone's motivations, what drives them, what they fear, and as a result, cater his response accordingly. If he senses someone has a deep-seated envy for an enemy of his, he will subtly encourage that person to become toxic, manipulating them to take action against said enemy without the king himself having to lift a finger. It is of no surprise the king is also an excellent negotiator, being able to make his opponents feel they have gotten a fair deal while also meeting his own conditions, which he so desperately craves. From the speech skill tree, we're taking speech mastery two out of two, kinship, business relationships, 
speculation, salesman, investor, fence, and trade prince. You'll notice these mostly involve making money, but with the speech mastery perks and a high speech skill, you'll still smash through the persuasion and intimidation checks anyway. With the kinship perk, your Breton heritage will shine through, allowing you to buy items for 15% less when trading with the same race, other Bretons. Notable Breton shopkeepers and vendors include Babette of the Dark Brotherhood and Bella Thor of the General Goods Store in Whiterun. Another speech option you'll be getting is Business Relation. This enables the king to create a good bond with the next merchant he speaks with after getting the perk. You will be able to buy items for 30% less from that specific merchant, so choose carefully. With the Salesman perk, you'll actually be able to sell any type of item to any kind of merchant, and with Investor, you'll be able to invest 500 gold with a shopkeeper to permanently increase their available gold by 500. Following the speech skill, we've got lockpicking, and from here we're only getting five different perks, the first of which has two ranks. So we've got Lockpicking Mastery 2 out of 2, Game of Fate, Wax Key, Locksmith, and Seen This Before. This will allow the king to be pretty good at lockpicking without a crazy amount of perk point investment. Having access to as much resources and information as possible is an advantage for anyone seeking power. And for this reason, the king learns to pick locks open, prying his way into their secrets. It's all pretty straightforward, but there is an interesting perk that you only need 20 in the lockpicking skill to get, and it's called Game of Fate. What this does is randomly place five dragons of fate around Skyrim, hiding them in various locked containers. Each one will give you 15,000 gold and a free perk point when removed from its container. Finally, we've got a level 100 lock picking perk called Seen This Before. At this point, the king is so good at lock picking that he can bypass locks of expert or lower level without using a key or manually picking the lock. Also, after you pick or bypass at least 100 locks, you gain two perk points. A very nifty addition to this build's perk choices. Similarly to lockpicking, the king is going to have a small investment into the pickpocket skill. The perks we're using are pickpocket mastery 2 out of 2, cut purse on the run, and stalk the prey. Not everything is hidden locked in a chest or safe somewhere. Sometimes there's valuable items that are so important they're carried on someone's person at all times. For situations like this, whether the king simply wants to steal something to sell or steal a key to get somewhere important, he must develop the ability to pickpocket. In theory, it could also be used to put pocket, framing someone else for being a thief, potentially getting them in trouble with the wrong people, removing them from a situation where you desire their position or they're just a roadblock to your advancement. We have the perk called On The Run. Now after you successfully pickpocket someone, sneaking is 200% more effective and movement speed is increased by 25% for 10 seconds. This is super useful for ensuring your escape. The king may be slow and careful in order to succeed with his thievery, but once he's got the goods, he knows the hard work really begins then, getting out of there and fast. We also have the Stalk the Prey perk, which, if you actually wait behind your victims with the pickpocket message displayed for 10 seconds, gives you 20% added to your chance to pickpocket any item. So this is very powerful and it should be used when it counts the most. Obviously, if you have to steal something rapidly at a precise moment, it won't be of use, but for when you can sit in hiding for at least 10 seconds, then it's well worth it. And finally, we have the Light Armor skill tree. The king may be an expert at avoiding the sights of his enemies and dominating his battles through might and strategy, but sometimes he can't help but get hit. From this skill, the king will want to get his gauntlets on the following perks. Light Armor Mastery, 2 out of 2. As a Leaf, Light Armor Fist, Unhindered, Initiative, 2 out of 2, Lightning Strike, Fight or Flight, Survival Instinct, Wind Runner, War Dancer, Glancing Blows, Tempting Fate, Evasive Leap, and Wild and Free. With As a Leaf, Sprinting in Light Armor makes you take 50% less damage from power attacks, and you cannot be staggered. This is added to by the Wild and Free perk, making you take 50% less damage from attacks in general while sprinting in light armor. With two ranks of the initiative perk, you'll regenerate up to 20% of your maximum stamina per second when you enter combat if you're wearing all light armor pieces. The bonus gradually diminishes over the course of 15 seconds. The king is able to move 10% faster in combat if wearing all light armor pieces thanks to the windrunner perk, and this will make you really fast if you chose to use the shadow stone for the additional 20%. On top of this, if you're hit by an unblocked attack or hostile style spell in combat, you'll gain 10% movement speed for 6 seconds if wearing all light armor. Still, it is best to avoid getting hit because of the War Dancer perk, which allows the king
King to build some momentum when wearing all light armor. It grants you 20% more attack damage and critical damage, but you lose it for 6 seconds whenever you get struck by an unblocked attack or a hostile spell. Then with the Glancing Blows perk, the King takes 30% less damage from blocked attacks while War Dancer is active. Then we have an excellent perk called Lightning Strike, which makes the King deal 75% more critical damage for 10 seconds after entering combat, obviously requiring you to be fully dressed in light armor. And finally, we have the Tempting Fate perk, which makes the King gain yet another 20% movement speed if he is not blocking during an enemy's power attack that misses. With all of the perks covered, how does it all work in the playstyle? Well, a lot of it should be pretty self-explanatory if you've been watching the video so far and listening, but I'll go over it anyway. The King tends to use stealth when possible, getting sneak attacks and avoiding the limelight. He'll stalk from one enemy to the next, slitting their throats in silence. To increase his damage via the dynamic entry perk, he will often use silent rolls to close the distance between him and a target before slicing them from a crouched stance. However, sometimes the King will be forced to fight in open combat, or he might just prefer to if it makes sense to be seen and there's not much advantage to stealth. In these instances, he opts to open battle with a sprinting power attack, gaining full advantage of the overrun perk. While sprinting, he will also be protected more by the as a leaf perk and the wild and free perk. Sprinting makes a lot of sense, so use it where possible. And remember, if you're successfully dodging attacks, you're going to be moving fast anyway. And if you're using the shadow stone, then all the more so. However, using the lord stone is going to make you more of a stand up power attack powerhouse. After sprinting in with a power attack, feel free to fire off more of them rapidly, regardless of your stone choice, dishing out lots of damage as fast as you can. Remember, if you repeatedly power attack a target, you'll benefit from the Into the Dust perk, stacking up and escalating your damage. This is great against tanky enemies such as Dwarven Centurions. He will expend a lot of stamina doing this, but he has a lot of stamina, and due to the Judgment perk, he will be getting 100 points of stamina when he slays an enemy under the effect of Clash of champions. Also remember to use regular attacks too, as the crosscut perk increases your power attack damage by hitting targets with regular strikes which they don't block. A good combo is that sprinting power attack, regular attack, and then power attack move, followed by another power attack. Don't forget if you can land a hit while your enemy is winding up their own attack, you'll benefit from Rogue's parry, doing 40% more damage and a critical strike. Another thing you can do is quickly entering sneak mode during combat with an attacker, getting 2 seconds of invisibility due to the Shadow Warrior perk and then getting a sneak damage kill. Just remember it has the 8 second cooldown with the Ordinator overhaul. Amongst all of this, you'll be lockpicking, pickpocketing, and looting things to sell, getting as rich as possible as you climb to influence and power. Remember too that you'll be able to use your shared ancestry racial power to temporarily steal another race's power once per day. Finally, depending on your choice of standing stone, you can use the Shadow Step ability to expend 50 points of stamina to dash to a nearby target within 75 feet with the Shadow Stone or with the Lord Stone. Stone, you can use Kneel or be Knelt, where once a day you can throw a target to the ground, dealing 15 magic damage and absorbing that much stamina for 10 seconds. Now let's talk about the gear, which is actually very straightforward. So we're wearing a full set of Thieves Guild armor, except we've switched out the chest piece for the Crimson Archer Cuirass, which comes from the Immersive Armors mod. This chest piece can be found commonly, sometimes on bandits. All of the pieces are light armor, and we found this style blend gave the King that very noble rogue aesthetic, which I've mentioned a few times. Someone who looks respectable, but also like you shouldn't mess with them. You can carry around a pair of your favorite fine robes and boots for times you want to roleplay dressing well in the presence of Jarls and so on. Remember during the Thieves Guild, Tenelia will give you the ability to upgrade one of your Thieves Guild armor pieces. If you choose the boots, they'll improve pickpocket by 25% instead of 15%. If you choose the gloves, they'll take lockpicking improvement up to 25% instead of 15%. And if you choose the hood, it'll improve prices by 15% instead of 10%. Personally, I go with the hood just to make more money, but ultimately just go with what's going to benefit you the most with how you like to play the build and how you're finding your experience. For a vanilla build, we recommend just wearing a full set of Thieves Guild armor or even the Thieves Guild Master armor when you're out and about achieving your goals, but then remember in noble courts and areas, you can, if desired, completely switch to fine clothes like we said you could do for the modded build. Feel free to find a replacement chest piece if you don't want a matching set but honestly, we think it's safer to go with the matching set if you're playing vanilla, as there's not a lot of alternatives you can slot in for the chest piece that give that exact same noble rogue vibe the modded build presents. Now as for weaponry, the build is using Captain Cordan's saber, which looks like a dangerous and maneuverable blade, fitting for the playstyle of this build. The weapon comes courtesy of the Oblivion Artifact Pack SE mod, 
Guard. You can find the sword in the Dainty Slowed at the end on a table, the Dainty Slowed being a ship located near the lighthouse northeast of Solitude. There are Corsairs on it who will attack you when you come too close, but you should be able to handle them easily enough. This one-handed weapon absorbs 10 points of stamina and 10 points of magicka upon each strike, and obviously the stamina is the only benefit for the king here. What it also does, however, is make the target move slower for 30 seconds, which plays into the theme of using underhanded tactics to gain an advantage. As for a vanilla alternative, you could definitely go with Wind Shear, the unique scimitar located on the Kataraya, a ship visited during the Dark Brotherhood questline. This scimitar gives you a chance to knock enemies down when you bash with it, and has a habit of making them stagger non-stop. Obviously for any character using lockpicking, make sure to carry enough lockpicks in your inventory. We may be able to open up people with our tongue, but we can't smooth talk our way to open a lock. And that wraps up build number 100 in our Skyrim Special Edition Builds playlist. Thank you so much for watching the video all the way through and for enjoying the creative role-playing content we love to make here at Fudge Muppet. If you really liked the build, I'd love to hear about it in the comments section below. And I'm also curious if there's anything you end up changing about it for your own playthrough with a slightly different spin. As always, our social media links can be found in the description below, so if you do want to see some Fudge Muppet behind-the-scenes info, or you just like the occasional Elder Scrolls or Fallout meme, you can head over there and join the fun. Thanks again for tuning in. It means the world to me that you love this content as much as we love making it. My name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.